Yeah, right, my guy. Sit right here. Thank you. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Okay, so, well, let's kind of start where you started. Yes. Um, how did you first get into playing music? Um, how did I first get into playing music? Uh, my, my mum and dad were um, very keen for me and my, my siblings, my brother and sister, to play music from a very early age. And so I think it all started on the recorder, like I'm sure some of you can relate. Um, and I ended up playing the trumpet, actually, at school, um, which I stopped when I was about... 14 or 15 because I just, I mean I did enjoy it, enjoy playing in a band and orchestra and stuff but um, I kind of just didn't want to practice, I was too busy doing other stuff and really my love for music started when I was about 14 or 15. Um, it's probably the bands I, I'd, I'd put it down to, stuff, uh, bands like Linkin Park and Blink 182, everyone know these bands, yeah? Um, I went into my brother's room one day and he was playing Linkin Park and that for me was like a real moment, hearing those heavy guitars and the drums and, and hearing these like passionate kind of, you know, what was, you know, formerly then known as emo music. Um, <laughs> or new metal, sorry. And, um, and that really just took me and I just, and, and I think a lot of people in my year, year group at school, um, were, you know, listening to all of those American bands, guitar bands, and suddenly everyone wanted to be in a band. Everyone wanted to play guitar, me being one of them. So I just decided I was going to play guitar too. So I had guitar lessons and I went to guitar and literally everyone was playing guitar. So you'd get like these 20 minute lessons and there was me like trying to play like good King Wenchless, like <laughs> I can still play it. Um, and yeah, and but by that point, loads of people had already got to a really good standard. And but no one was playing drums and basically I had two really good mates at school who were in a three-piece like punk pop band, did like Blink-182 covers, New Found Glory, Starting Line, all these kind of bands. And their drummer was a guy in the year above and he left their band to join a different band. And they were really bummed out. They were in the kind of rehearsal room with their one on bass, one on guitar, just kind of jamming, but you know, with no drummer. And I was just watching them and I was sat on the drum kit and I was like, I was like, guys, maybe I could, you know, maybe I could be your drummer. And so I, e I emailed this guy who I knew played drums in my year, the only guy, and I said, can you teach me the drums? And he, so we met up, I think it was like a Sunday night after chapel. Um, and, uh, and he taught me a beat, this just simple 4-4 four, four beat, which was literally, you know, dun, dun, cut. and, you know, within a kind of half an hour, I could do that. Dun, dun, cut. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. <laughs> And I was like, this is just amazing. I can play the drums. Whereas for me playing the guitar, I spent six months just being like, ding, 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 you know, just found it so hard. And, and essentially, if you can learn a 4-4 four, four rhythm on the drums, you can play a pop song. So I could then, I then went down, back down to that rehearsal room, which was a basement at school and could play along to those duh, 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 those kind of American style pop punk, uh, pop punk songs. And so there I was, I was in a band, I was a drummer, and then I was just hooked and obsessed. And I carried my drumsticks around with me everywhere. I played drums every day. You know, you start changing the way you dress. I used to wear three quarter shorts, pull up my socks. I started painting my fingernails black. I, I literally, the works. And then we'd play at all the school parties and stuff. and. Um, so having gone from not really doing that much music growing up, I was suddenly obsessed and kind of swept away and taken by this kind of scene, this American uh, music scene that, that um, had found its way to a public school in the Midlands. Um, and there I was, a drummer in a band, and, and that suddenly drumming, being a drummer, and, actually, and also uh, growing up for me playing cricket, drums and cricket were suddenly like my two things. So whenever anyone said, you know, what do you want to do when you're older? I said, well, either be a cricketer or a drummer you know, not actually thinking that either would happen, you know, so. And how did that kind of get you involved in McFly and how did that, did that then turn into McFly? Yeah, that, quite a quick turnaround. Yeah, um, you got involved when you were 17, right? Yeah, that's, that's you right. You took it, off. Yeah, that's right. So I was 15 when I started playing the drums and like I said, com you know, came completely obsessed and practiced every day. I started getting lessons off, off a teacher at school and 
he was a great teacher because he, well, great for me because he just let me come in. I'd bring in my CDs, you know, like boxcar racer CDs and Blink CDs and, and be like, how do you play this? And he would just show me. I didn't have to sit there and sight read and do rudiments and stuff, which are very important. But at that time, I found I just responded better to that kind of, you know, education drum wise. Um, and so I was practicing very hard. You know, I got to a relatively good standard within the year. And basically, Charlie Simpson, who was in Busted and is again now, um, he went to my school. He went to a school um, called Uppingham in the Midlands. And so I'd seen Charlie, you know, well, everyone in our school had seen Charlie go off and join this band Busted and be really successful. And it was really weird for everyone at the school. You know, we'd, we'd be in like the... Um, the place we'd go and have break and have food and stuff. It's called the Buttery, which my, <laughs> my bandmates find hilarious. Um, and we'd see Charlie on the TV and we'd just be like, that's crazy. And the fact that his band name was Busted, because that was like a slang word at school for like getting busted drinking or busted smoking. <laughs> it was just this really weird thing. And anyway, the guy that I was in a band with at school, that three-piece band, the guitarist, Josh, he... In, so Charlie was in the year above, he really wanted to do what Charlie was doing. So he used to go down to London and audition and, you know, just like Charlie did and try and meet like music managers and stuff. And we did, me and Josh did business studies together as well. And we used to sit in the back of business studies and talk about our band and he'd tell me about going down to London and stuff. And one day he calls me and he's like, mate, I've just met Busted's managers and they've got this new band, they've got these two guys that, and you know, they're putting a new band together and they really need a drummer. And I was just thinking, oh, that's crazy, you know. And he said, you've got to come and audition. And I think a lot of people think that if you're in a successful pop band, that you were at theatre school, you were always desperate to be successful and famous and that you were that 10 year old on stage, you know, performing, whatever. That was just totally not me. I literally thought, that'd be fun, go to London for a day, you know, on a Saturday as well, because I had school on Saturday. And I had a cricket match that day, so I genuinely <laughs> considered not going. Yeah, and I had to get permission from my cricket coach. Anyway, I thought classic, day off school, get the train down to London. Didn't know what I was doing, just took my drumsticks, um, turned up to Covent Garden, and there was this big queue. At, and I'd, I mean, I'd been to London, but this was all kind of new to me. I was 17. There was this big queue outside this venue in Covent Garden. And actually, the front of the queue was Dougie. Um, you all know Dougie? Yeah. Um, <laughs> front of the queue was this guy, Dougie. And I was wearing this Starting Line T-shirt. It was just this, this band. And Dougie was like, oh, Starting Line. He was like, oh, yeah, cool band. I was like, yeah, cool. Cheers. <laughs> and... Um, there's this massive queue and I'm thinking like, what am I doing here? Like, I'm completely out of my depth. Um, but, you know, I think I was a fairly confident young guy. I was just like, got to do it. Just fight the nerves. And then I remember this car arriving and these two guys coming out of the car. In hindsight, like ridiculous looking guys. They had the most ridiculous haircuts and clothes and stuff, but they had this presence and they walked out and they had these guitar, holding guitars and guitar, guitar cases. And, and it was Tom and Danny. And everyone was like, that's them, that's them, that's, that's, that's the guys in the band. And it was like, oh, that's them, that's them, you know. <laughs> and in they strolled. And yeah, I went in and it was like a kind of, kind of like that X Factor audition process, but without the cameras. It was, you know, you got given a number, they took a photo of you, you walked in and you were put in groups of like 10 and there was a drum kit in the room and a bass guitar and an amp. And then like six people on the table. Tom, Danny, the two managers, someone from the record label. So you're suddenly just like, oh my God. <laughs> like, and there's all these people playing the drums and some of them were amazing, some of them were really bad. So that kind of made me feel a bit better. I was like, okay, good, he's rubbish. I'm better than him for sure. But I'd never auditioned before. I didn't, I'd never, I mean, I think I'd prepared something, but a terrifying experience. But one thing that struck me was, um, everyone was really nervous and everyone walked up to the drum kit like with their head down and you know when they said their name they were kind of just like you know mumbling and 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 no one wanted to sing either so when they said you know do you sing no everyone was like no you know they're just too nervous they kind of awkwardly played the drums awkwardly played the bass and went off so I just thought right I'm just gonna go for it so I went up and was like hi I'm Harry 
Um, and they're like, can you sing? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm not a good singer. And I sort of pulled up a chair and, you know, Danny played Year 3000 on guitar and I kind of awkwardly sung it right in his face. <laughs> And there's the audition tapes are out there somewhere and I'm just, I'm dreading the day if they actually find them. But anyway, the manager had made this big speech about, you know, these, these guys, they're signed, they've got a record deal, it's the real deal, they're going to be on TV. And so I was just thinking, amazing, that's my claim to fame for the rest of my life. You know, I went back to the, and I got through to like the last 10, which was, you know, epic. I was like, awesome, that's a great story. That's like my pickup line for the rest of my life. <laughs> and... Um, and I went back to my boarding house that evening and was like, I remember I was t there was the fourth form, I was in the lower sixth and I was telling the fourth form, these like 13 year olds, I was like, yeah, so I went down to London and, you know, I got down to like the last five, I think I maybe halved that number. Um, and, you know, this band, they're going to be on CD UK and Top of the Pops and like whatever, you know. Um, and then I went back to my room and I had an email from the manager saying, hi, Harry, good to meet you today. You know, we're really impressed with your audition and we're considering... You, you know, it's down, you're down to the last two drummers. And I was like, I was like what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> suddenly your pickup line to so yeah, Suddenly I was like, yeah, exactly. And um, so then, it was, this was the end of the summer term at school. I just finished my AS levels. Um, two A's, a B and a C, by the way. Um, <laughs> I think maybe it was just one A, but. Um, <laughs> still hyping. <laughs> still hyping, always hype it. Um, and, I went down again to London and did a two day audition this time in a rehearsal room with Tom and Danny. They had a session, session bass player playing the, the songs on bass. And me and Martin, this guy Martin, we, we basically just swapped over. We, the songs, I don't know if many of you know, like early McFly songs, but the demo songs at the time were That Girl, Room on the Third Floor, and Obviously, and Surfer Babe. So that was the four track demo that Tom and Danny had made. And the, the, one of the managers had s sneakily sent me that demo CD in the post because he wanted me. And the other manager didn't know this. The band, didn't, Tom and Dan didn't know this, but he'd sent it to me in the post. So I'd been listening to it <laughs> and like learning the drum parts and um, singing them in my study, you know. And um, so we spent two days just playing, you know, these songs and just seeing how we got on with Tom and Danny. And I, I've, Tom and Danny have since told me that I, they were like, yeah, you were, you were like, we weren't sure about you, you were quite annoying. Like, you, <laughs> you're like, you asked loads of questions. And I think I was just trying to sort of show that, you know, I could, yeah. you know, get on with them and stuff. And, and this other guy, Martin, to be honest, he was a much better drummer than me. He was from Drum Tech, which is like a drum school, and he was a brilliant drummer, he was better than me. But I think what I had over him was just the fact that I seemed like culturally to connect with Tom and Danny more. Like, we were into the same bands, we kind of dressed the same, and Danny and I clicked quite easily. Danny's really easy to get on with, and we clicked about sport and stuff, and, and Martin was a really nice guy, but I just don't think he quite clicked with them. And anyway, two weeks went by, and I got a phone call. Really, um, my manager, still the same manager now, he talks a lot, like even more than me. Um, and this like long-winded phone call went on, and eventually he kind of summed up and so that's why, and I'm like, yes. And that's why we'd like you to be in the band, you know? And I was like, oh my God. You know, had that, that kind of moment. I was at home, I remember, I was like, mom, I'm in the band, I'm in the band. And my mum and dad were just like, right, you know? <laughs> because, you know, I was at school, I'd done my A-levels, they thought I'd go to uni, kind of do all that. And, and they sat me down and said, you know, we don't want you to be in the band. Um, I know, right? <laughs> I'd just been made, I'd just been announced I was going to be deputy head of house as well. So that was my dad's speech. He was like, you know, you've been made deputy head of house. Um, you could be captain of cricket. And I was like, dad, deputy head of house, come on. Like this band's got a record deal, yeah. But I basically just said to them, look, um, you can't stop me. Um, <laughs> and I clearly remember saying, and if, you do trust if you do stop me and this band goes on to be a real success then I'll never forgive you um <laughs> I said that because I was like seriously on your head be it like and I remember them looking at each other going okay and literally a couple of days later my dad was driving me up to London with my suitcase and a duvet I remember having like a duvet 
and I moved into it. So I, I announced to all my friends, I'm just like, I'm, guys, I'm not coming back to school next term. Told the school I wasn't coming back. And my dad drove me up to London and dropped me off at this house that, so Tom and Danny had got a record deal, basically. They'd done all the hard work. They got the record deal. And they just chose this house to rent, to, you know, the money they'd got from the record deal. They're like, we're going to rent this house and this is where our band's going to live. So I suddenly left school, moved into a house in London and was in this band called McFly. And that was that. And then the first night, it was just, you know, getting to know Tom and Danny, really. And that was it. So you've, you've talked a lot about the influences that, different bands had on you yeah. but obviously there was a contemporary band at the, at the same time busted mm -hmm. um, I was wondering was there ever a rivalry or a kind of we've got our eyes on you you've got our eyes on us like we're doing similar things yeah and how that then evolved into becoming the super group McBusted and yes, how that right. experience played out I think there was a kind of unspoken rivalry so <laughs> because Tom so Tom had originally auditioned for busted and was in Busted for 24 hours. <laughs> True story. So it was originally a four piece. They were gonna be a four, uh, four piece guitar band. And that was the reason Simon Cowell didn't sign them because he didn't get it. He was just like, I love, love the guys, I love the songs, but I just, why have you not got a drummer? I don't get it. Um, and they, yeah, they originally, Tom, they, Matt and James were in the band, they picked Tom and Charlie. And Tom was stoked, he was like so happy and then, 24 hours later, we got a phone call to say, I'm so sorry, but you know, you're not going to be in the band anymore. And uh, it was actually this producer that produced the busted demos and he wasn't sold on Tom's voice because Tom had this, had a bit of a lisp. And Charlie, to be fair, it was just like a superstar, you know, like this six foot kind of looked like Elvis Presley, just walked in, like sings and like got this incredible voice, you know, and. So you don't need Tom, so like, get rid of him. Um, anyway, they, I mean, and, and at the time, Tom was, he was a singer, performer, you know, whatever. Um, and he turned out to be an in, this incredible songwriter and, and they fortunately nurtured him and started his own band. So there was that connection already. Charlie, like I said, was at my school. Matt and Tom went to the same school. Tom and James both played Oliver in the West End. So there were these already these kind of really weird connections going on. And of course, we had the same managers. And also James had written a lot of early McFly stuff. So James had a vested interest in McFly. He introduced us on TV for the first time ever uh, when we performed on CD UK. So he like, you know, said, this is McFly. He did a line from the film Back to the Future where he says, you know, you kids may not be ready for this yet, but you're going to love it. It's a scene from the film. And... Um, so there was this connection. There was like, you know, I think Matt and Charlie kind of did, you know, they wanted us to do well, but not that well. Like they didn't want us to do too well. Um, and I don't think we ever released at the same time. I think our management always made sure. Um, and there was a, I mean, there was a, yeah, there was a kind of unspoken rivalry, I guess. But I mean, I remember once where it was, they used to have this thing, Song of the Year. It was this thing on TV. I don't know if you guys remember, it was quite, it was a big deal. And one year McFly and Busted were in the same category and there was Girls Aloud and all these other people. And the voting would come in, like they, there was a presenters would be like, and the votes would come in from the Northeast and da da da. And it was really close between McFly and Busted. And I remember when it got announced and Busted had won, and I remember them celebrating so hard. They were like, yes! And it was in front of us and it was like, mm, okay. <laughs> they really wanted to. But, it you know, came out. <laughs> yeah, but we really wanted to win it too. But, um, yeah, there was a genuine kind of crossover there. But, yeah. And how did that then evolve when you became McBusted? How did that, how did that start? And well, how did it feel to kind of move away from your focuses I guess there was yeah I guess there was this thing where we always did look up to we always looked up to Busted because when we first started McFly they were already famous they were already s successful sorry but they were famous as well it was like oh my god that's I remember we when we were in our band house and James came over for the first time and I was like oh my god that's James you know there was this thing you were starstruck it was like you know and so there was always that kind of level of like respect and so it was exciting to be in a band with them. There was that, still that thing where we still kind of did look up to them. And, and it was exciting to suddenly be playing busted songs as well. 
we'd kind of hijacked their the big busted comeback, you know. And I guess we'd always kind of been fans of their band and, and you know, had a huge amount of respect for James, brilliant songwriter, had written a lot of McFly songs, written some brilliant busted songs. You know, we, we looked up to Matt, you know, Dougie particularly had always looked up to Matt and so to suddenly be in a band with him and, you know, and I think there was that mutual respect. And because it had connected with the public as well, like it was just this exciting thing. It's such an exciting thing to be a part of. And so it was just very special and, and just very, it just happened for the right reason. That's something that we live by now that you can't force things, particularly in the creative industry. If it happens like naturally, if it happens for the right reasons, then it's going to be special. And that just happened completely naturally. It, it wasn't this cynically kind of thought up, you know, marketing tool. It was just this idea that happened naturally. The stars aligned, you know, it sounds corny, but the stars aligned and it, and it happened for the right reasons and, and it just worked. So. Yeah. And as, as you kind of said, you were quite young when you started in McFly. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, how did you find that challenging at all? And what kind of challenges um, did you face and had to overcome as you moved up? through your musical career? Um, yeah, definitely, there were, there were challenges. Um, I think for me, there were different challenges to what the other three guys experienced, because you know, I was really lucky. I had a really fortunate upbringing. Um, I went to a great school. I really enjoyed school. Um, and my three bandmates kind of, not Tom so much, because he went to a theater school. So it's a very different experience for him, but like Tom and Dougie, sorry, Danny and Dougie particularly didn't like school. Dougie was a, a real kind of outsider. You know, he was at a school where being into music and being into skateboarding stuff meant that you got bullied. Danny equally being at school, he got bullied for being into music. Everyone was into sort of like football and like just, I don't know whether it was garage music or something, you know, playing guitar was, <laughs> playing guitar was not cool. So for them, it was always just this incredible thing that was happening. And of course it was for me too, but I loved school. I had such great friends at school and the first three years of McFly were so intense like you know you look back at our diary and we'd have like half a day off per month you know it was just non-stop and you just uh, uh, in this sort of whirlwind of yes excitement but also ex like exhaustion and just like pressure and just and I think the main thing for me was like my mates were all on gap here just having fun and had no responsibility. And then they were at uni. I know this sounds ridiculous because I was so fortunate, but I don't think I realized how fortunate I was. They were all at gap year, going to uni, no responsibility, just having fun. And I used to actually, I used to come down to Oxford, Brooks. Um, Cause I had, a, <laughs> yeah, I had a few mates at Oxford Brooks. Um, my brother went to Brooks. Um, and I used to come down cause I wanted to like, be normal, you know. I wanted to come and hang out and go to like clubs and just be a 19 year old, 20 year old. And it was a tough at times because you just couldn't be normal. Everyone's looking at you the whole time, particularly blokes your age didn't like you. They feel like, you know, they feel like you think that you think you're awesome. So you, blokes don't like you. Um, and I did find that tough, you know, and I missed my mate's 18th birthday parties, I missed 21st, I just missed things. But then when my, le not that this is like a warning for you guys, when they then left uni um, and they had to get real jobs and <laughs> they were in debt and, <laughs> sorry, um, that, <laughs> that was when I was like, oh, okay, now this is good, like now I have a really cool job. Um, so join a band. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think I did find that hard and I did have moments where I'd kind of, you know, I'd go home and my parents lived in the countryside so I could go home and get away from it when there were moments where you couldn't escape it and it was tough. You know, even like you go to the local pub and everyone there wants to talk to you, everyone wants your photo, everyone thinks they know you, people feel like they own you and, and so there were times where, yeah, it was pretty tricky but that's all the complaining I'll do. I'm very lucky and it's been good. So. Yeah. And you, you recently released a book talking about some of the struggles that you had when you first started out and mm -hmm. how you addressed that. And I was just wondering if you could talk about kind of the evolution of, of that idea that you had for your book yeah. um, and where that came from. Basically. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I recently released a book called Get Fit, Get Happy, um, which 
I think seems a bit of a sweeping statement, you know, um, which I've, you know, tried to explain in interviews and stuff. But often in interviews, you know, you have like five minutes on this morning sofa to try and summarise your concept and idea for a book. Um, <laughs> and basically, I've always, well, I've been, always been into sport. Um, and then the past six years, I've been really into fitness. And um, I just felt just from an outsider looking in on the fitness industry that um, all the focus was on aesthetic, all the focus was on, you know, how to get beach body ready and how to kind of get abs in six weeks or, you know, eight minute abs. And, and, and I just felt like no one was talking about fitness from the other perspective. And me, me personally, exercise has been a huge part of, of my life. So, I've suffered with um, anxiety um, since about the age of 19 and exercise for me is like the best tool to help me deal with my anxiety. And I just felt like actually that could be quite a good concept for a book and could potentially resonate with some people, but also potentially be a good message for people that maybe do suffer with anxiety or whether it be depression. I've had family members with depression. I've had you know, lots of people close to me that have suffered with mental health issues. And um, um, I just felt like it was a topic that people weren't talking about enough. And regardless of whether you have mental health issues enough, exercise in itself has incredible you know, mood boosting benefits and, and obviously amazing health benefits. And so I just felt like I wanted to write a book that was focused on that. So partly biographical, talk about my kind of story partly research based and then come up with a fitness program that sort of summarized that philosophy that I had. So it was a program that was not based on, you know, do this for six weeks or eat this chicken and broccoli and nothing else, you know, carbs are the devil. Like it was, it's just purely a fitness book with some fun ways to kind of potentially get some exercise done and, um, um, and focus, like I said, yeah, on all the other benefits of exercise. And I felt that if I could, open up and talk about the issues I've had, then maybe that'll, you know, help some other people. And um, yeah, so there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we're now going to open up to the audience. So if you could put your hands up, if you would like to ask a question and wait for the microphone to come to you. Well, um, I was at a thing the other day, by the way, where we did a press conference for Tom's show that he's got at Christmas. And we did this whole performance thing. We all, I danced and Matt sung a song, Tom sang a song. I thought it was really good. And, um, and then we opened up the floor to the press afterwards. There was quite a few press people. We hired out the Palladium for the morning. It was like, right, so he's got some questions. And it was just literally like... <laughs> it was just like, seriously? Yeah, you're like sweating. So you're please, like, oh. do ask some questions. <laughs> yeah, please, please do. If you have some questions, now's the time. Yeah, uh, wait for the microphone for a... Yes. Do you want to... Um, I was just wondering, what is your favourite McFly song? My favourite McFly song? Ooh, um, probably some unreleased stuff, um, but that's not helpful, is it? Um, <laughs> probably a song that maybe some of you know, it's one of my favourite songs we ever did, um, which was released on the Greatest Hits, was a song called Don't, Don't Wake Me Up. Anyone know that song? Yeah? She knows it? You know? Yeah, 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 that's one of my favourite songs. Um, I actually prefer the, the, the original demo we did for it as well. Uh, when we were living together, Danny started getting into producing music and he had a studio in his bedroom. And the three of them got obsessed with this band called Jellyfish. And at the time I was kind of just off, kind of doing my thing, being a bit naughty. Um, <laughs> and they kind of immersed themselves into you know, the music and they, that was when they did, that was when we did um, our third album, Motion in the Ocean. And you had songs like um, Little Joanna, um, Bubble Rat. And on the original demos for that was Don't Wake Me Up. And that was like one of my favorite songs. Like for me, that was like, this is gonna be the first single off the album, right? I'm like, this is the best song. And, and kind of la the label and management weren't that fussed about it. And they're like, no. Nah. And I was like, oh, really? Um, <laughs> so I was really happy that it eventually got heard. So, and I love, well, I love a load of the songs, but yeah, I'd say that one because it's just kind of not that well known. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, should we go to the gentleman just there yes. next? Also, if you want to stand up uh, when you're. This ask is your question. moment. Stand <laughs> Sorry. up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
Come on, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Also, when is the album Six coming out? <laughs> How can I digress? <laughs> um, so I was telling some people upstairs earlier about, you know, what's happened there. Um, I'll try and tell a quicker version. Um, but as you can imagine, I seem to struggle to uh, do that, condensed stories. But basically, we released our last album in 2010. And 2011, I did Strictly Come Dancing, and Dougie did I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. And he came back from Australia after winning that show, and they started writing some songs, and they wrote these brilliant songs. Um, and then we ended up doing a Greatest Hits album because the label were like, look, you guys are just one, two primetime TV shows. You're everywhere. Like, this is a great time. I think you can understand a record label. They're like, greatest hits, greatest hits, you know. And we were just a bit like, really? Greatest hits? Like, we've got so much, so much more we want to achieve. But our management were like, look, trust, trust us. This is a good thing to do. So we're like, Phew, OK. Um, and the songs we'd written there, we felt we wanted to save. We didn't want to, like, put them on a greatest hits as sort of add-on songs. And Tom had written this other song on a ukulele, a pink ukulele that he'd bought from Argos, I think, um, called Love Is Easy. And it was a lot more of a kind of chilled, like, sort of had, you know, a bit of an early McFly sound to it. And we're like, this is a really cool song. You know, this could be the single off the greatest hits. So we did that and time went by we toured and on the tour we kind of I think we then did another tour we played a few of the songs that were going to be on album six and then eventually we got around to recording it we went out to Texas recorded the whole thing had a great time out there um, we released the first single of the album which was Lovers on the Radio um, and had the four shows at Royal Albert Hall for our 10 year anniversary but that was when McBusted happened and we had always planned to release the album even whilst, and then to do the McBusted tour sort of after that. But we had no idea that McBusted was going to be that successful. And it was pretty clear once we'd announced McBusted, you know, it was like our management were like, look, it would be really weird if you suddenly released a McFly album amongst all this carnage. And we were like, yeah, definitely. We need to, this McBusted, this is a thing now. Like this is a band, this is an actual thing. Um, I was saying to some of you earlier, it was initially McBust, uh, McBusted, well, it wasn't even McBusted, it was just going to be McFly with Busted, come on stage, do a few Busted songs. And someone jokingly said McBusted, and it was like, you know, oh, well, that's kind of funny. Um, I, thought, I thought it was a really bad idea. In fact, when I first joined McFly, my mates used to take the piss out of me at school. They used to call McFly McBusted, because they were like, oh, they're just like basically a copy of Busted, like, oh, the, like, Muck Busted, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, now who's laughing, yeah? Um, <laughs> and um, so then we did Muck Busted. That went on for two years. We toured that for two years. And then that came to an end. And then now this is the part where I blame the children. We had children. Um, and it's still in the making. <laughs> so there's a lot of reasons, but... Um, Hopefully next year we'll get our act together. We we went on a writing trip last uh, this January. Wrote some even like new songs, some really cool songs. But truth of it is, it's not one person is not to blame. But I think suddenly Tom had like book deadlines, and then suddenly I was doing a book, and then Danny was doing the Voice Kids, and Dougie was in LA doing some was so showbiz. Dougie was in LA. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, and just, and then like it's done, Tom's had his book out, I've had my book out and just, it's just, we all, we've been meeting all year and talking about it and we just all agreed that there's no point in doing, you can't do McFly half-heartedly. It has to be a full commitment. It can't be like, oh, next Tuesday you're around, should we write? It's gotta be like, right, we are writing the album now. We're recording the album now. This is everything. It can't just be this half-assed thing. So. Um, so when we do do it, it's, again, like I said, got to be the right time and got to be for the right reasons. So soon. There you go. Could have done that so much easier, shorter. <laughs> Could have just said, yeah, next year. Next. Uh, <laughs> Thank you uh, for your question. Um, yeah, sure. Should we go to the young lady here? Hi. Um, Hi. What was it like filming Just My Luck? 
Haha. <laughs> uh, is that a loaded question? Um, funnily enough, uh, as I talk about in my new book, Get Fit, Get Happy, um, I was going through a really weird phase actually during then. I was suffering really bad with like um, panic attacks and just had like anxiety like 24 7. And, um, you know, due to being mainly my fault, I'd, I, you know, don't too many drugs. Um, as Dougie says, don't do drugs, kids. But it's, it's true, don't. Went horribly wrong for everyone involved. Um, and so for me, it was a really weird experience. You know, I was probably having the worst time of my life in a time that should have been the best time of my life. You know, we were shooting a Hollywood movie with this, you know, superstar female actress with a, an actual Hollywood movie, you know. And there was me just freaking out. <laughs> um, and there's this scene in the film, actually, where I get lost under the stage, you know. He's like, where's Harry? Where's the drummer? <laughs> and I come up from under the stage, and um, I, ge I genuinely like, had, a, I was, I, like, had a panic attack when we were shooting that part of the film. And I had, like, ran off set, ran to the trailer, and Danny was there, like, comforting me, you know. Um, so it was, a, it was a really weird time in my life. And, you know, my manager was like, look, you can go home if you want, you know. And I remember thinking, like, Harry, you bought this on yourself, you know, you've, you owe it to the guys, you owe it to everyone involved to just get through this. And I got through it and um, got home and got help and everything turned out okay. But I wish I could tell you some really cool stories, but it was a really weird time for me, you know. I did really try and enjoy myself. I went out a couple of nights, and, but I remember just kind of just... I was just freaking out. But, I, you know, you're better off asking the guys that. They had an amazing time. They wrote some really cool songs off the back of that. There's a song called... Um, I can't, ultraviolet um, and um, the lyrics to that you know based around shooting just my luck and um, but I mean I can look back on it you know there were some great moments there's some crazy things happened um, but let's not go there <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your question thank you yeah sure should we go to the person in the purple jumper behind you but we'll come to you next What's your favourite opportunity that being a McFly has given you? Um, there's been some incredible opportunities um, that you know McFly has given me. Some amazing ones. Um, two things, probably. I think just the opportunity to be a drummer, just to be able to play the drums. You know, I think potentially if I hadn't have done that audition, I'd have probably still played the drums, but I'd have maybe done something else and maybe have not been able to kind of continue learning and, and, and playing the drums. That's been an amazing experience for me, progressing as a musician and being able to even say I'm a musician for me still feels a bit weird, you know, because it was something for 15 years of my life that I wasn't, you know, I was, I I'd identified as something else. I identified as like a, a kid that liked to, thought, he, thought he was, played sport, you know, I was certainly not very academic, but, um, so yeah, being able to play the drums and be in a band, I just that's just an incredible thing. But also doing, you know, Strictly Come Dancing, that was a that was a insanely amazing opportunity that I, I had initially said no to several times because I was too terrified. I remember clearly having a conversation with my brother just saying, "Mate, I just don't want to do it. I just I'm just not going to do it. There's just no way I'm going to do it." Yeah, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> um, but just because I was scared, I was I just thought I don't want that pub that sort of exposure on my own to be on TV to be like this is Harry Judd he's on t he's dancing he's famous you know I was always very comfortable just being the drummer in the band McFly I think people didn't potentially know us as individuals we were just known by our kind of fan base and I was scared about being you know pushed forward into the public eye you know but <laughs> Who am I kidding? I loved it. Um, <laughs> and you won yeah. it. Exactly, right. So that was an amazing opportunity and that has led then, you know, having done that and turned, you know, turned out I could dance. I had no idea I could, but it turned out I could dance and then I won that. And then that, having won that, you know, that carries weight. That, that has, has held, given me other opportunities. So yeah, those two things. <coughs> Thank you. And did you have, also have a question in front? Um, yeah, you mentioned you uh, like Linkin Park and they got you into like the drumming and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like Linkin Park too. Um, 
So yeah, we lost Chester earlier this year. So how did his death like affect you? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Um, I think as a band, you know, we were there together and we talked about it, and it's it's very very sad. You know, I think. Like I say, I know people close to me that have suffered very badly with de depression. Um, fortunately, you know, it's something I've never suffered with. Um, so I can't talk on the subject, you know, uh, too deeply. But there's also, a, a, um, yeah, something really kind of strange about seeing someone who seemingly has everything, you know, in life and in his family and in, like, everything to sort of you know, lose it all and, and just, well, just, just kind of choose to, to take his own life. It's something that is very hard to understand. And um, there was, a, there was a, a guy called Lil Chris. I don't know if you guys remember Lil Chris. Um, someone, again, who took his own life. And that, again, as a band, that hit us really hard. He was someone that supported us on tour. He um, was this amazing kid, this, like, such a nice kid you know enthusiastic charismatic talented you would never know never know he had depression and um it's really really sad and so you know hopefully some good can come from these 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 things these awful things in that hopefully people can you know speak out and get help for these problems so um it's very sad and um you know, long, long may he be remembered. And, and like, as you said, he was uh, an inspiration for, for certainly all of us in McFly, so. Thank you for your question. Um, sure, let's go to you, you, just there. Hi, kind of on that topic, um, could you say something about your involvement with the Brain Injury Rehabilitation, Re Rehabilitation Trust? I always struggle with that word too. When I go on to talk about it, I'm always like, brain rehabilitation, rehabilitation, <laughs> rehabilitation. Um, so basically, my wife's um, brother has a brain injury. He was 18 years old and had a uh, road traffic accident, as they call it. Um, awful accident. He was pronounced dead on the scene. He was... On the M25, he's a, my wife's, they're proper musicians, they're family, they're like all classical musicians, you know. It's embarrassing when I'm there at Christmas, they're all like got their violins out and I'm just like. <laughs> um, and um, you know, classical FM's on and they're like, oh, who's this composer? I'm like, Mozart? <laughs> and um, anyway, they're all brilliantly talented musicians and Rupert is the eldest, there's, there's four of them. My wife's the youngest, there's Rupert, Magnus, Guy and Izzy. Magnus is an incredible violinist. Guy's a world-renowned cellist. Izzy's a be beautiful violinist as well. Rupert was a French horn player, and he was actually on his way back um, home in the middle of the night because he had a French horn lesson the next day, and he, he drove into the back of an articulated lorry. It was pronounced dead on the scene. It was revived. Uh, it was, you know, in a coma. Had a 24-hour brain surgery. Had his left frontal lobe removed. Um, devastating, obviously, for the family. Um, and their life was just turned upside down. And um, Izzy was 12 at the time, and it had, a, I think, a huge kind of impact on her life. You know, she's 12 years old and suddenly trying to sort of digest that sort of, you know, scenario. Um, it's hard enough being 12, 13, you know. And um, anyway, when I met Izzy, Rupert was Rupert, as he is now, post-accident. accident, And so I kind of can have a different perspective on it, you know. To me, he's brought a lot of happiness to my life. He's, a, he's an incredible character and just literally lights up a room. Everyone loves him. He's, a, he's just a wonderful, wonderful person. But he is, you know, he has 24-hour care. Um, and Izzy and I, you know, thankfully, but me being in a position, I'm able to, to kind of raise awareness and... Um, I really wanted to raise some money for um, for uh, for Rupert and for people with brain injuries, and so um, about 2007, I just, 2008, I think I thought, well, I'll just run the marathon, you know, easy. Uh, it's not. It's really hard. Um, and so did that, raised some money. Really enjoyed the experience, you know. Um, really enjoyed kind of the experience of being able to give back to others, and also, you know, you just feel like the pleasure of being able to 
raise money and to be able to have people listen to you and stuff. And so that then inspired Izzy to set up the Eyes of Light appeal, which is um, was basically inspired by the fact that she one day just said, you know, when I go and see Rupert, his eyes just light up, you know. And so she decided to call it the Eyes of Light appeal, where we raise money um, so that users of BERT, which is the Brain Injury Rehabilitation Trust, um, users of BERT, um, that are all these care homes around the country can make a request to sort of, I don't know, go to the theater or, or you know, we've provided keyboards or trips to the ballet or, you know, for instance, they use the money to buy Rupert, uh, Rupert's carer a car so they could drive in places and things. So um, yeah, it's been amazing. And, and recently we got given a book where well, most years we get given a book by the people that are involved with all photos from, um, you know, events that people have gone to, like I said, like the ballet or whatever it may be. Um, and it's incredibly moving. And so um, I think, you know, if you're lucky enough to do what I do, then then you have a, maybe it's a bit of a strong statement, but I feel you should really, you have a responsibility to try and use, do, use it for some good as well, so. Thank you. Thanks for your question as well. Um, anyone else? Yeah, sure. Um, this is kind of off topic, but how much control did you feel like you had over the band? So like earlier you mentioned like the managers, like making decisions and things like that. Like mm -hmm. how much control did you feel like you had? We, yeah, yeah, no, good question. Um, we were very fortunate because, you know, Tom and Danny in particular and Dougie and me a little bit, um, wrote all the songs. Um, I think the record label, we were always lucky. We were kind of a new style of boy band, if you like, you know, that actually played their instruments, that sung and wrote their songs. So we did have a lot more control than your typical kind of, you know, pop band or boy band, you know. I think Busted really broke the mold there, you know. I remember when we came out, you know, and Busted came out, suddenly it was not cool to be in a boy band. Like, it was not cool to wear suits, matching suits. It was not cool to sit on stools, like, you know, and we're proud of that. We broke the mold, but we were essentially a boy band. But it was strange because to us, we didn't really see ourselves as a boy band. You know, like I said, we were influenced by like Linkin Park and Blink-182. And so we were always kind of, you know, I was at school being like, oh, busted a lame, you know, like. But we didn't, we were cheekily singing Year 3000 when no one's looking, you know, because they're great songs. Um, so for us, you know, there was always that stubbornness. There was always that, no, we're not doing that. You know, so right from the beginning, from artwork to writing the songs to, you know, music videos, we always thankfully were given a say, but we were brilliantly managed. You know, there's only so much a 17, 18 year old guys really know about the music industry, about, you know, what we're doing. You know, we watched our first video back, Five Colours in a Hair, and we were just like, we were distraught. You know, we were like, what is that? Like, that is the lamest, we're like, this is so lame. And we're like, no, that's not our band. And, and we were like, we could film something better ourselves on handheld camcorders. We're like, but the label who could, we were older and could see the appeal. And, you know, they did have control on things like that. And, they, and we did have to trust them, you know. And I think then you're kind of then fighting back against that initial stall that you've set of what your band is, you know. I think every album we've ever done has been a reaction off the past album. You know, Wonderland was quite, you know, it's quite experimental, like quite out there kind of album for a, the pop band, the boy band of the time, you know. And then the next album was a lot more colourful because we were like, oh no, we need to embrace that, you know. And so then we were doing songs like Stargirl and things like that. So, but no, we've, we've always had a, you know, control, but I think we've always been really well managed and, and we've always, there's also that thing of not wanting to take full responsibility for your decisions. You know, when it comes to like choosing a single, you know, we, we're like, I don't want to choose. <laughs> like, yeah, I would have chosen Don't Wake Me Up. You know, what do I know? Um, so there is that thing of wanting to, you have to trust your management and your label. And, and so I think we had good relationship, good relations there. And um, yes, there were frustrating times where maybe, you know, and also when you're 17, 18, you're quite rebellious, so. I mean, they used to, they had meetings at the record label about my sideburns. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously, no joke. Like, once there was like, we had a half an hour meeting about your sideburns, Harry. I mean, I had side, I look back and I'm like, they were right, you know? 
I had these massive burners like down here and I had a mullet for God's sake. Like, <laughs> did, did you get rid of them? Eventually, but not because they told me to. I'm like, no, what? they don't know what they're talking about. These are awesome. Like, you know, me and Dougie got our tongue pierced and they were getting tattoos and like, I, cause I could grow a bit of stubble. I was like, grow my, you know, and you imagine for that, the label, they're like, no, they need to be clean cut. They, you know, the girls need to like them and stuff. But I think in a way that's what people liked about McFly is that we were, we weren't like your average kind of boy band. So there we go. I think we have time for one final question. So pressure. Pressure's on the person Make it a good who asks one. it. Okay, sure. Or yeah, maybe we might come to you depending on how I'll answer it quick. on the long that answer is. <laughs> um, bit of a weird question, but are the all the girls referenced in songs, are they all based on real ones? Um <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes they are. Give me some examples, I'm just trying to think. Okay, so like obviously it was written about um, Tom's now wife when he was, wasn't with her. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Wow, I'm gonna cry. I should tell that story more often. Um, there's a lyric that goes, um, he's in the Marines, he'd kill me. That was slightly hammed up. The guy, her boyfriend at the time was in the police. Um, <laughs> It was like, yeah, this, that sounds, he's in, the, no, he's in the Marines. Yeah, that sounds better. Um, so that was about Giovanna. Um, and then, I'm giving all the credits to Tom here, but he wrote all about you as a Valentine's Day present for Giovanna, for his girlfriend. I know, I mean, come on. <laughs> like, this song is like the most <laughs> amazing kind of, you know, romantic, beautiful lyrics, like just, ch you know, he's annoyingly talented. Um, <laughs> And he, he recorded it in Danny's bedroom, in Danny's studio that I was telling you about. And he recorded it all on his own. And he originally did this kind of barbershop version. And it was all like, about, about you, baby. It was all like that. And he'd done, it was, that was like the backing vocals. And it, it was quite good for me. Um, and then I remember him playing it to Danny. And Danny was like, ah, I fucking hate that song. Like, he was like, what's that barbershop shit, you know? Like, and so, and so we kind of, you know, and then we got asked to do the comic relief single and they played them all. We played Richard Curtis, you know, Richard Curtis, the, yeah. Played him that song and he was like, I love it. And so then we recorded it and the producer kind of took out the barbershop stuff. But yeah, so that was for G's Valentine's Day present. Um, I'm trying to think of other songs. Yeah, there was, uh, yeah, there was Please Please. You know the lyrics to that one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, for those who don't know, um, look it up. Um, yeah, so s most of them are, yeah. I think it's more fun when you've had an experience, you're like, oh, let's write about that, you know. So, but then other times they're just fictional, so there we go. We do actually have time for more, so do you want to <laughs> um, wait for that? I can hear her. Or just yeah, you need the no, mic? No, oh, it's for the camera, the sorry, right, right. Okay. Yeah, it's just, a it's just recording. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you have any weird superstitions or mantras that you have to do before you get on stage? On stage? Mm. Or like before Strictly or any public yeah. appearance? So before we did for McBusted actually, we did this thing called the clap. And I don't know where it came from. It obviously wasn't me, but we did this thing before we went on stage with McBusted where the six of us would stand around the dressing room. It was like, okay, you ready? It's like, okay, guys, the clap. Like, we'd literally be in the dressing room. Like, you would not go on stage unless we'd done the clap. And it was this thing where we would stand in the dressing room. Like, we'd stand all around the circle. It was literally like this. And no one would call it. It would just... And we... <laughs> and everyone would have to do it in perfect, like, in sync. And so you get this one clap. And it was like, yes, that was a good one. Let's go. But sometimes we'd be there on, like, clap number eight. We'd be like... That fucking oh, okay. <laughs> nope. That, and like, it literally, you'd have the stage manager being like, "Guys, seriously, like, you're five minutes late. Like, we can't go on." Um, so, but actually, any other time, I find I don't get really nervous. I don't get like mass, like stage fright. I just just get like a bit nervous. Like, I just have this feeling of butterflies, and I find that just a distraction. Like, I can't kind of focus on anything so I just kind of wander around just being a bit nervous and kind of just you know um but I, I warm up on my drums and kind of that focuses me and then uh, for Strictly No I just 
shit in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was just, I mean, just like beyond terrifying. So, um, was that, sorry, was that more scary than yeah, live performance? Yeah, 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 way scarier. I mean, uh, since doing Strictly, anything I do performance wise or like anything I've ever done before the curtain goes up, I'm always there just thinking like, what, why do I do this? <laughs> like, why do I put myself through this? But I think if there's any advice I can give, it's, you know, never shy away from a challenge. Don't let your nerves or your anxiety be the reason for saying no, because you're always going to learn something from it. And you generally, like, I've never regretted it. And there's no more satisfying feeling than kind of when it's over. Like, yes, it's over. But you feel like it, you've achieved something. And um, that's just a thing. Often when I get asked to do things, it's like, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it because... I don't want to regret not doing it. And um, so, yeah, but Strictly was terrifying. And so whenever I do anything now, I think, well, it's not as bad as Strictly. So, um, yeah, that was, just, that was just literally a thing of like, every time you go out to dance, I'd be there going, wait, is it, is it my, do I go on my right foot first? Is it, you know, like literally just the first step, like just stepping, it's like, is it right foot? I don't know, is it help? <laughs> you know, and somehow by some pure fluke, some miracle, I didn't mess up and, um, I don't know how, but yeah, that was terrifying. So, but anyway, yeah, don't let nerves, they sometimes will get the better of you and they do really weird things to you. You know, like adrenaline is the weirdest thing. You, you can be playing a song and sometimes you play a song to a click track. So just because it feels better to, to play to a click. So like a tempo thing, if anyone doesn't, that doesn't know that. Or you might have something on, on track, like some weird synth that's on track. So you need, so, I mean, it really only falls on the drummer when it's click track because they're just playing to you. So they're just, they're all on stage just messing around. I'm like, guys, <laughs> I'm going to click track. Um, but when you're really nervous and say like, I don't know, remember the first song of the McBusted tour, it was like really big build up, really big deal. And we were there at the Glasgow Arena and just, you know, we had pyros and it's like massive stage with the DeLorean flying through the air. And it's like huge build up and there's like huge screams and it's, just so intense and like you're there and you're playing the song and it's literally like it's <laughs> like oh my god like and you're like I'm like convinced that the guy backstage has pressed the wrong song I'm like you put the wrong song on because everything just goes in super slow motion and you're like oh my god and you're just I'm like gripping the sticks that which is like the worst technique ever because it's don't drop them on my um but you eventually kind of, uh, and then you get into it and it's fine. But yeah, anyway, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. a, nice, a nice question to end on. Mm -hmm. um, would everyone please join me in thanking Harry Judd?